Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our last session of the, uh, this year's edition of the Young Academy for Leaders. Um, today we have the privilege to host our colleagues from Hungary. So uh, since Hungarian is not the easiest language, I'll just have a look at uh, to properly pronounce their names. So um, we have Peter Turcs. I don't know if I said, said that correctly, Peter. So welcome. Peter is the operating director at the Center for Fundamental Rights in Hungary. And then we have Zoltan Koskovic, who is the geopolitical analyst for the Center for Food and Fundamental Rights. And what they will be talking about today is the what are fundamental human rights and the Western understanding of the human person. So this is a very, very important topic for us. Uh, over the last few weeks, or actually few days, we have spoken a lot about economy, about other things. But in reality, I think as if we do not, as conservatives, have a proper understanding of what a human person is, I think we may be in trouble. So um, without further ado, I would like to welcome Peter to give us his introductory remarks later on Zoltan, and then we will open it to our questions. So I hope uh, you had a chance to really think about it. So welcome once again. Yeah. Good morning and thank you very much for the invitation. If you allow me, I briefly would like to introduce our organization to you and then just speak a couple of words about our today's topic, human rights, which I think it's a very broad topic and uh, we can discuss it together and maybe broaden the picture and if you would have any questions beside of human rights or, or political or societal question so which has a link to human rights, we are very happy to discuss it with you or answer your questions. But allow me to briefly introduce our organization, uh, the Center for Fundamental Rights. Uh, the Center for Fundamental Rights was established in uh, 2013 and it was high time from a legal perspective in Hungary because you know the Hungarian conservative parties won an election with a two-third supermajority first in uh, 2010. Uh, Fidesz, party of Mr. Orban Viktor and uh, the Christian Democratic Party together reached the two-third majority. Of course, the, the reason was that the former socialist and liberal government made a terrible governing uh, before 2010 and that was the reason that the Hungarian electorate with a huge margin turned to the conservative side. And in the first 20 years after the regime change in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, was very important from this perspective because when Hungary became again a democracy, there was no um, super majority, two third majority for any political parties in the first 20 years of democracy in Hungary to create a new constitution and to create a solid democratic legal system for the country. Of course, after the regime changed, the, the whole legislative structure and framework was so-called democratized by the, uh, by the democratic parties, but uh, our constitution was a so-called provisional one, not a solid one. And already in the campaign process before the 2010 elections, the conservative parties described their intention uh, to adopt a solid new fundamental law and accordingly to create a solid legal structure uh, which was very much needed uh, in the past 20 years in Hungary. And when the conservative parties as governing parties started the new legislation in Hungary, uh, even to start a debate in the Hungarian parliament about the new constitution, the so-called fundamental law, the whole criticism from the progressive left internationally and domestically started uh, to erupt against the Hungarian government. Uh, maybe you have heard about that, how they described Hungary as an undemocratic nation, that the conservative parties are undermining the rule of law. Uh, they are not going to comply with the EU standards if they're adopting a new fundamental law for their country. Uh, and if they're amending cardinal laws uh, which have impact on the everyday societal life, they become a non-democracy. Uh, and as, young, as a long lawyer, me and my two friends uh, thought that it's high time, it, it, it is important 
to establish a civil society having focus on legal system and the legal changes to describe from a professional side to the Hungarian international public, public what's the reality of the Hungarian legislation and the adoption of our new fundamental law. And that's our story uh, of uh, establishing uh, the, the Center for Fundamental Rights. And we started it with four colleagues and now we are uh, over 60 employees working with us. Uh, and we became from a, a very much legal focused uh, uh, civil society organization uh, to an old fashioned think tank dealing with all sorts of political and societal questions. So my point is that we are gonna speak of course uh, about the human rights topic, uh, but not only from a legal perspective, uh, but I think from a political perspective as well. But if you allow me, I would like to introduce you the, the human rights issue from a historic perspective, and then we can turn our conversation into a more political one. So to fully understand the concept of fundamental rights, uh, we need to consider the definition of human rights. Human rights are the set of rights uh, that an individual has by virtue of being a human. These rights are not created by the state, but must be protected and respected by every country. Their philosophical roots go back to antiquity when they were primarily moral imperatives and maxims, and in the Middle Ages they were mainly expressed in laws and charters promulgated by the sovereign under pressure from the nobility, and of course in the Middle Ages human rights had a very strong religious concept. The Enlightenment in the late 18th century broadened the scope of those rights by declaring that all persons are entitled to human rights from birth. Uh, for example, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizens of 1789 in France was the core document of uh, uh, the human rights concept of the modern times. And the subsequent process of constitutionalization turned human rights into fundamental rights. Fundamental rights are therefore human rights that have become part of our legal system and that belong to the citizens as a member of the political community. There are no conditions attached to the granting of their, these rights and the limits to their exercise are set by constitutional constraints. As human rights, fundamental rights are not created by the state but only recognized by it. Their primary function is to protect individuals and the communities they create from public authority. We distinguish between several generations of fundamental rights, basically in the uh, academical life of uh, legal studies, they differentiate between three generations, but according to my point of view or point of view, there is a fourth one. But uh, let's speak about the first uh, three generations. There is the first generation of fundamental rights. Uh, the emergence was between the 17th and the 18th century. And the first generation of fundamental rights are the classical liberties. Uh, these rights are regarded as automatic entitlements because they are subject to the will of individual alone and can be enforced in court if violated by the state or anyone else. The state is expected to primarily abstain to not interfere with the free exercise of these rights. Within the first generation of fundamental rights, a distinction is made between personal freedoms like uh, the right to life and dignity, the right to personal liberty, the right to freedom of conscience and religion, and the other part is the political freedoms like freedom of expression, freedom of press, freedom of association, or freedom of assembly. And then came the second generation of these human rights in the late 19th and early 20th century. They were the rights uh, of economic uh, and cultural and social rights. They emerged as a counterweight to the laissez-faire capitalism of the late, seven, late 18th and early uh, 19th century, with the exception of the right to choose one's occupation. None of these rights can be regarded as an automatic entitlement, and the state is therefore expected to intervene and play an active role. Their, inform they, their, uh, their, their enforcement may vary according to the state's capacity to bear the burden and consequently they cannot be enforced by legal means. At most, the legal entitlements passed as legislation that give effect to these rights can be taken to court. And for these examples, to name a couple of examples, these are the economic and cultural rights, economic rights uh, right, like right, right to work, right to strike, and cultural rights 
right, like right to cultural freedom, uh, right to education, and there are of course social uh, concepts of these rights, the right to social security and the right to physical and mental health. And there is the almost last generation of human rights, the third generation of fundamental rights. Uh, the third generation of fundamental rights are typically collective rights that seek to build on the solidarity of the international community to address global problems. Apart from the right to information, informational self-determination and the right to freedom of information, they cannot be considered as automatic entitlements and thus show similarities with second generation fundamental rights in terms of enforceability. And just a couple of examples for these rights, like global rights, rights to peace, right to the healthy environment, and there are group rights like patients' rights, children's rights, and rights of people with disabilities. And as I mentioned uh, earlier in my speech that uh, according to our opinion or set of minds, there is a fourth generation of human rights, which can be easily described as how to turn human desires and human wishes into human rights and how to create uh, an atmosphere within the Western world to abuse human rights in order to uh, have a blackmailing tool in the hands of the progressive left to put pressure on different nations and different political forces in the name of human rights and, uh, and fundamental rights and how to put pressure from a moral high ground on societies, especially on the majority of societies, to accept certain human desires and human wishes as human rights from the side of a very, very small minority compared to the size of the, the total uh, societies. Uh, but it's not my task to elaborate on that topic, and if you allow me, I will give the floor to my fellow colleagues all the time to elaborate on that topic. And thank you for your attention.